Um, Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, interview with Kayla Husen, July 10th, 2017. We are at Kendall Square. I'm Eric Marcus. Tape one, side one. So, <laughs> you're going to open or am I? Oh, no, I think we'll start. Um, I wonder if there's, any, if there's anything you'd like to say to the many people who have written to you after... I invited Making Gay History fans to share their thoughts with you. Well, I was going to get to that. But anyway, I'm thrilled with your podcast project and thrilled to be in it. Um, there's a saying that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Um, but history teaches the younger generations what sorts of things they can do and not do in order to advance the cause. I love being a pioneer, and um, and passing along gay history uh, in photos and in text. Uh, I've written some about it, but I'm more famous for my photos of historic events. And Eric, your podcast reaches literature uh, reaches listeners for a wide and uh, wide range of all walks of life in uh, people in the east and the south the midwest the west even australia it's wor really worldwide and as our movement is worldwide too so i'm really thrilled with your podcast projects um Anyway, it's really gratifying to be a pioneer and to be able to rem remember all this and pass it along to younger people. Um, what, what might you like to say to some of the people who, who have written to you? Oh, I, I was thrilled with all the letters. Uh, and I'm a picture person, so I especially like pictures. This picture of the two girls going to the prom together is just marvelous. And I liked getting that. I liked getting um, a letter from a father who was felt much better about his daughter and her prospects for a happy life. Um, what else did I get? I got something from um, Georgia. I forget what they said exactly. <laughs> It's beginning to all um, mush around in my brain. Um, refresh my memory. Now, what else? The people who write hold you up as, a, um, as someone who did extraordinary things. And I wonder if you and Barbara felt that you were doing extraordinary things at the time. No, we didn't. We took it one day at a time. We were trying to get more people into our cause. So obviously the work that we did, sending out newsletters, doing the latter, which was the Daughters of Belitis lesbian magazine that went to like 300 people at the most. And most of them were shrinks and professional people rather than gay people. But... Um, all those outreaches. We were trying and trying to get people, gay people, interested in the cause. And most of them were really more interested in socializing or finding a mate. And not that many people in any minority are going to be interested in their cause. I don't think that many black people are really gung-ho about their history and their causes. So when you... Um you said that, that a lot of the people who came were, were looking for a partner. Sure. If I, remember yeah, if I remember correctly, that was your motivation. Well, my motivation was twofold. When I learned there was a little embryonic gay movement, I was thrilled. Um, and I thought, well, I will go and I will join. And even if it's only small, I will keep going and... I will try to accomplish two things. I will find someone to love and be a life partner. 
and I will try to do some good in the world by promoting this cause. Yeah, if I remember correctly, you met you met Barbara at the first event you went to. Is that right? No, I wrote to Daughters of Belitis, mm -hmm. and they passed her letter, my letter, on to her, uh -huh. and uh, she wrote back. And she said, well, we're going to have a little meeting in New York at the end of the month or whatever, but I won't be there. I'll be on the West Coast. I'm going out there on vacation. She was going to the uh, Daughters of Belitis headquarters then and uh, trying to do whatever business there was to be done. Um, and she said, uh, I'll meet you when I get back. So that was fine. I went to this meeting, and I thought I would walk into a great big room full of people, all hard at work at desks, typing and everything, filling envelopes, whatever. There were, I think, four of us. <laughs> Including you. <laughs> Including me, right. And it was in the Mattachine office where we shared some space. So... It was uh, quite a shock <laughs> to be there all alone. And uh, Florence Conrad was there from the West Coast. So it was really only two New Yorkers and me from down from Boston, where I lived then. And uh, Florence Conrad, who was the Daughters of Belize's research director and who was very eager for us to participate in uh, research uh, into uh, lesbianism to try to figure out was it what made it was it okay and all those archaic things that we concerned ourselves with. I, um, did you have a sense that there was a lot of work to do given how few people were there, or did it, did you? Oh, of course. Uh, you know, we couldn't think what to do to get this organization off the ground. But uh, we knew they were ahead of us out west, but they were having their troubles in, because Daughters of Belitis was split down the middle. So many of them really wanted just a social organization. They wanted to get together Sunday afternoon in a coffee clutch kind of thing. And um, the other half wanted to try to do something more political. They didn't know what, but they were um, interested in the ACLU and their work and law reform. Law reform was a big thing. So, go ahead. When you were, uh, when we met last in, I'll start again. When we met last in 1989, you and Barbara were talking about the idea of gay retirement homes. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> no kidding. And I wonder... Uh, she used to call it the Lavender Light Years or something like that. I, don't, I forget. So I wonder now, you're in a, re a retirement community, yeah. and uh, what's it like being a gay elder in a, in a straight retirement community? Yeah. Are there issues that have come up for you here? Well, when we applied here, uh, and it looked as if they were going to accept us, as a couple, with nothing was said about being gay. But anyway, when we applied here, I said, now I want to talk to your director, the head person here. And uh, so he came in and I said, now uh, I want you to understand something about us. We are a gay couple. And not only that, we're gay activists and we've had a certain amount of publicity in our lives we might even having, be having publicity in the future. <laughs> so I said, I just want to tell you this in case you have any problem with it. And he said, oh, we have no problem with that. In fact, our food, food director is gay. He saw you come in the front door and told me who you were. <laughs> and then he said, and we have gay people on the waiting list come here. So I knew that with this would be an agreeable place to to uh, come. What has your experience been since? Have people been accepting? Oh, totally. 
I mean, it is Quaker run, and they, well, some Quakers are quite conservative out west in particular, but here they're very liberal, and um, I haven't had any problem really with anybody if they have a problem they're not telling me and uh, I just go about my business here and blend in and have good straight friends and now there are some other gay people here um, there's one fellow who's especially active in trying to get a little organization together but we have a gay dinner table and once a month, the last Wednesday of the month, we meet in the main dining room, which you didn't see, but it's fancier down there. We meet there, and I take along this little flag, gay flag, and the American flag. There it is over there. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. And I would put that in the middle of the table, plant our flag, <laughs> and uh, the little button with showing Barbara picketing. And um, so we have anywhere from four people for dinner to maybe nine or 10 people for dinner. Now we know there are others here, but they don't really want to come. Why not? Who knows? I mean, and there was one woman, I thought she wouldn't want to come because she's always sort of been, been here and everybody knew she was gay, but she never said it. Uh, so I thought, well, now, will she really come here for dinner and want to be at this table with the flag in the middle? <laughs> well, she has come. <laughs> and uh, she's not objected to the flag, and everything seems to be fine. But now we have this dinner group going. Uh, I know there are a couple of others, but couple of guys, they don't really want to come. They like to eat later and uh, cook gourmet food and so forth. So I, I think it, it's maybe an excuse. I don't know. But um, um, I'm sorry, I'm lost my train of thought. You said, you said that you, you blend in, but I did notice that on the back of, of your scooter. Yeah. Uh, can you describe what you have on the back of your scooter? I can't remember. <laughs> I've had so many stuff on my front door, in here, all over. What do I have back there? Can you describe, describe oh, what this National is? National Equality March, June 11, 2017, worldwide. So you keep up with, you, you keep up with the news. Oh, I watch uh, uh, Gay News USA every Saturday night with Ann and Andy, Ann That's Northrup and Andy Hum. And um, it's a lifeline for me, that and Philadelphia Gay News. Sometimes I've seen Windy City Times. Um, so I keep up pretty well. And what do you think of, the last time we talked was nearly 30 years ago, mm -hmm. um, and a lot's happened since then. What do you think of the world now for LGBT people? Very dangerous in many places, very, very wonderful in others. It's just uh, quite a mixed bag at this point in time. And the more our cause advances, probably the more uh, homophobia will emerge in various spots of the world. Um, it can be dangerous. It can be wonderful. Who knows? What is it, um, and I always avoid asking the feeling questions, but it's, it feels appropriate. What does it feel like having been one of the people who was there at almost the very beginning? Yes. And, before and Stone. Well before Well Stone. before. And to see your work come to, uh, what is it like to see your work having flowered? in this extraordinary way. Oh, it's fabulous. Especially when gay marriage came along. That was really a breakthrough. That was wonderful. Why was it wonderful? <laughs> well, it gave us, uh, legally at least, uh, legal equality with uh, straight marriages. And 
hopefully uh, the equality that isn't legal but is social and that we also crave. If Barbara had lived, would you have married? Oh, yes, undoubtedly. That's not in question. We were in Toronto when the marriage was legalized in Canada, and a lot of gay friends were rushing out and getting married. But we didn't want to do that. We wanted the whole thing fully equal in the United States with all the advantages. That's what we wanted. We didn't want anything short of that. So uh, we didn't take advantage of it up there. I need to look at my questions because my memory isn't what it used to be either. Um, who were your heroes in the movement? Oh, well, um, early on, I would say way back when, in the dark, dark ages, <laughs> I would say uh, there were a couple of uh, women lawyers in Chicago. I'm not sure they were out, so I won't give you their names. But Pearl Hart was yes, one of them. Yes, Pearl Hart, right. Yes. Did you uh, ever meet Pearl Hart? No, but Barbara was very fond of her, and I think Pearl Hart left Barbara a necklace or something that was very lovely. And I'm not sure I still have that or what's happened to it. I can't keep track of all my artifacts, but um, our, our, and we were, we thought very well of Randy Wicker, who has since uh, taken up rather some peculiar positions, we feel, and doing some strange things. But initially, he was the first to call for, for picketing and he was the first to have a public picket at the Whitehall Induction Center in New York. And uh, we, uh, let's see, was I there? Gee, I can't remember. I have pictures from there. I'm sorry, That's I okay. really don't remember if we were there. But I know we admired Randy, who was, you know, willing to be a standout. Oh, I know. He also went and uh, picketed a, a shrinks le lecture. Did you know about that? No, I don't think I knew about that. What is that college that's free and it's down in the Bronx, at, or rather down in the lower Manhattan? The New School. Yeah, no, not the New oh, School. Oh, Cooper Union. Cooper Union. Yes, we picketed at Cooper Union. There was a shrink there who was uh, speaking on homosexuality and illness or something. I've, I've written it up, but I don't remember the exact title. Was his name Charles Socarides? No. No, it was somebody else? No, no. It was somebody you never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the shrimp strings subscribed to it. Some of them were more famous than others for their books and their aggressive approach. Um, oh, Dr. Dince, I think it was, D-I-N-C-E, you never heard of him. Anyway, Randy got up in the audience and demanded equal time for a rebuttal. <laughs> well, that was unheard of. Nobody had ever confronted a shrink that way in public. And um, uh, anyway, he was afforded uh, 10 minutes only. But, you know, he gave a nice little presentation. He was brave, and then he went on late-night TV and all those things. So he was really cutting edge. And then he said, we really should pick at the White House and in Washington. And Jack Nichols joined the, him in, in pushing for that. Frank Kameny down in Washington thought that was a little too far out, maybe, and how what would we focus on. And then Castro was threatening to put homosexuals in internment camps. Well, when that news appeared in the New York Times, uh, Jack and Randy said, you know, it's time we've got to get out there and make this an issue. Here's the, here's the cause that we can hang it on. So um, anyway, um, 
that's how the first Picus in Washington came about. And they had only, I think, 10 people. And um, we weren't there. I was in Ohio with uh, my grandfather was ill and dying. And so anyway, we were out of New York area. Um, but uh, when they found out that nothing, the world didn't fall in, the sky didn't fall, um, uh, they decided it was time for another White House pick at this time with publicity and really good, well-done signs and all of that. So that accounted for the first really substantial White House picket. And Barbara and I were there. People say to me, well, you're not in any of these pictures. Were you there? I say, yes, I was behind the camera taking the pictures. I even had a good friend of mine say that to me, were you there? And I said, John, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. <laughs> anyway, were we were at the first White House, I mean the first big White House picket. I was at the Pentagon picket, so was Barbara. Um, and we didn't get to the State Department picket. Uh, but we also uh, then uh, switched to Philadelphia, and the, um, in, the what is it, <laughs> Independence Hall. Is that what I'm saying? Is that right? I'm running out of gas. Anyway. So when you, um, when you went to those pickets, mm -hmm. I just have one question about that. When you went to those pickets, what was it like being there? Was it scary? Was it exciting? Well, Barbara refers to it as scary in some of her interviews. I didn't feel that way because, frankly, we found out by experience very early on there was no danger because nobody expected us. And we came out and people couldn't believe it. Their mouths were hanging open. One woman said, they're just actors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they weren't prepared with any rocks or bricks or anything to throw at us. They were just dumbfounded, and they, Frank would address the crowd. There's one picture of Frank addressing the tourists in front of Independence Hall, and they are just looking incredulous that <laughs> this guy would be standing up and saying he was a homosexual and saying why we should have equal rights. So I didn't feel a sense of fear. So I have a couple of things I'd, I'd like to uh, like for you to say so we can use them in, um, uh, in the podcast. One is, um, I'm Kayla Husen, and this is Making Gay History, which is what I say at the beginning of every episode, so we'd like to have you say that. What do you want me to use the Tobin name to? However you want to say it. Well. I'm Kay Tobin Lahusen, and this is Making Gay, History. Making Gay History. So say it one more time. I'm Kay Tobin Lahusen, and this is Making Gay History. <laughs> is that good? Okay. What else? The other is um, we've been asking people to say, uh, to say, I made gay history when, and then say when they felt they made gay history. So if you can say, I made gay history when... I marched in a picket, or I made gay history when I photographed such and such, or I made gay history when I met Barbara Giddings. However you want to mm -hmm. say that. Well, I made gay history when I uh, met Barbara Giddings, really, and I made gay history when we marched in the earliest picket lines, well before Stonewall. And we made gay history when we uh, joined the American Library Association gay group and a push for better books on gay themes, gay positive books. And I made gay history uh, when I joined the fight against uh, the American Psychiatric Association listing homosexuality as a mental illness. Thank you. Are there other things you wanted to ask, Sarah? I was just wondering was maybe what Sorry, I don't want to speak to you about you, so you're not here, but I'm trying to get what American is worth. Um, what, Kay, would, what would be top of your 
list for organizing for action now? Like? Uh, yes. So uh, given this is 2019, oh, no. <laughs> 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 Getting ahead of myself. Given that this is 2017 um, and all that you've seen change during your lifetime, what are the things you think we need to organize around now and fight for? Oh. oh, what a damn question <laughs> to field when I'm so tired. It's okay. Uh, um, do you want to think about it while we do some photographs and then we'll make that the last yeah. question? Okay. Tell, that, tell me that question again. Yeah, what should um, we do to advance the cause now? Exactly. What should we do to advance the cause now? Well, Americans in general need to be more politicized. And once they are, I think they'll see the need to um, join the cause and uh, try to uh, watch what's happening in the courts and at the lower levels of politics where we really need to get organized. We can't just look at presidential elections. We badly need organization at the lower political levels. So if you were 25 years old now, what would you be doing? I have no idea <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> I'd be at the computer all day long like the rest of you. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, as you know, I'm a photo fanatic. I would hope I would still be taking pictures of the cause in various ways. Okay. So let me just look at my questions for just a second. Um, okay. That should do it. Mm -hmm. And so let's take some pictures. All right. Um, Is there anything you want to add? Oh, that's Sorry, no, that's the question. I always tell people, you, so is there anything... Well, what did I write down here that I can't even read? <laughs> the question is, is there, if there's anything I haven't asked that you'd like to comment on, please do so. Um, well, I think we'll begin to realize that so much of the world is passing us by and, and being better on the gay subject than we are. And uh, I think gay people have got to wake up and realize, you know, politically, we just have to organize. And I think we'll always have to organize. I think we'll always have to be vigilant, unfortunately. Thank you. It's so wonderful <laughs> to see you again after so long, Kay. Thanks. Well, I had a good time with your book. I had a good time with you today. Okay. When did Carla J. begin her movement? Who's got her on his list? Of yeah, I don't know. I'm forgetting when Carla J. first I got don't her. think she's been in that long. No, not as long as you. <laughs> well, nobody's been in. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, Barbara was in much longer than I. There aren't many people living today who've been in, lo uh, uh, in as long as you have. I know. Yeah. You are. Um, actually, that brings me to one of my um, one of my first questions. Um, have, are you set, sir? Uh, yeah, I'm set. Okay. Um, yeah. How do you feel about being called one of the mothers of the movement? Well, I don't think of myself as a mother of the movement because. There were a lot of people before me, not a lot, but certainly um, my partner Barbara was in the movement well before I was. We met in 1961, and she was in the movement in what, 1956 or something, she found her way to DOB, and they had already just established that. What I'm thinking is that for young people now, because you're still here. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, it's one thing to think about the people who are, who, who are gone, who have died, but of the people who are living now, um, I guess I have to say, I think of you as one of the mothers of the movement. <laughs> well, that's kind of you. <laughs> uh, I think it's the truth. So, um, 
how did these dinners start? Well, it's hard to say these particular dinners because Barbara and I used to talk about a gay retirement home and how that was so desirable. Uh, and that was years before we came to Kendall. But um, I always hoped that there would be something here that would enable gay people to get together. The exact form, I didn't know. But um, I don't remember how it was that we fastened on to a dinner club. But here there are, there's a German club, a French club, uh, a vegetarian club for dinner. The vegetarian's the biggest. They're huge. <laughs> So who, did you, um, how did you, who did you talk to first about organizing this, or were you the principal organizer? No, I wasn't, but I did promote it. When I heard that Carol and Marge were coming here um, and first met them, I talked about it, I think, with them. But I'm not an, an organizer. I'm a, an activist. You know, I go out and march, and I, I do photography of uh, other gay people. I like to promote through photography. But um, I was never one to get involved with, um, what were we talking about? Organizing. Organizing. Yeah. But Carol and Marge were ideal for it. But I did, we talked about, wouldn't it be nice to have a, a dinner table or some way of getting together? Now we have that, I still think we should have a gay movie night uh, and once a month and show a gay, gay-themed gay movie. I see there's a centerpiece on the table with a rainbow flag and an American flag. Uh, who's behind that? <laughs> well, I dreamed that up. As a photographer, I'm always looking for um, items that will stand out and be helpful in conveying what's, what's, what's at hand in the photo. So uh, this has the gay flag and the American flag and artificial flowers, uh, all of the rainbow colors. And uh, the interesting thing about having this in the dining room is, for example, when we get up to leave the table and I'm moving away here through the crowd, um, and I'm holding this thing in my arms as I drive out on my power chair. I've had people come up to me and they say, oh, my son is gay, or oh, my daughter is gay and has a partner. You know, I mean, they, these parents here who have gay children, they need somebody to talk to about it. And they don't feel comfortable talking to their straight friends. Very often they don't really know exactly how to talk about it. So I just love to move around here with this, <laughs> this centerpiece of the gay flag and the colors. So it's, a, it's your calling card. Well, in a way it is. Um, Kay, our listeners know you from that interview I did with you and Barbara. 30 years ago in a yeah. cozy living room in, in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, we've, had, we've had tens of thousands of people listen to <laughs> the episodes in which you're featured. Mm -hmm. um, and they're curious about what life is like for you here as someone who devoted her life to activism um, and now is in a retirement community. What, what is your life like? Well, uh, people, I think, have heard of me. A lot of them have seen me with this lovely artifact. Um, I have pictures all over my room. I'm reduced to one room now in uh, skilled nursing. But I have my photographs of the earliest pickets in our cause and assorted other photos of other pioneers including Barbara, and uh, I feel I'm pretty well integrated. If there are people who don't like me, I don't hear about it. <laughs> and I imagine you don't care. Well, 
I mean, you always know there's some homophobes if you get a big crowd of people, but they're fewer and fewer. And I just take it for granted that I'm accepted. And I don't hear to the contrary, because if they don't like me, they don't say so. <laughs> or it's for other reasons. Oh yeah, just, just like quickly, like when you moved here. Yeah. Uh, um, when, when did you move here, Kay? Um, 1970, end of the year. Uh, to Philadelphia. Oh, to Philadelphia. Well, I mean, actually, to here, to Kendall, when did you move? Yes, in 1970, the very end, I think December. And uh, Barbara died in 71. So Barbara died in 2001. Is it 2001? 2071. Um, uh, 2007, I'm sorry. So, so you moved yeah. here in 2007? Yeah, and so I moved in in 2006. And Barbara died how soon after you moved here? Well, it wasn't too many weeks after, but I can't remember exactly. In February, yeah, February 18th. She was sicker than we re 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 realized when we moved in. I so vividly remember spending that, that time with you and Barbara. It seemed yeah. like yesterday. I had a picture of it, too. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have been photographed by Kay Lahusa, who's <laughs> going to have an exhibit at the New York Public Library for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. You know, I heard about that, and Jason said he would send me his address so I could be in touch with him. But I haven't received that yet, so I may. I thought maybe it, the idea was abandoned. Not at all. I'm going to see Jason on Wednesday, and I'll tell him that we saw each other, and he can uh -huh. in touch with you. Oh, that's all right. I mean, if he has no reason to be in touch with me, it's okay if he isn't. Well, he's lucky if he gets to tell me. Oh, <laughs> not at all. Thank you, Kay. Well, thank you for coming and doing this, including this in the mix of your podcast. I think it's a great dimension to it. We're very excited. And we're going to be taping during dinner also. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Just sounds. Well, you'll, you'll inhibit our conversation, which is normally scintillating, of course. But I don't know that that's going to work very well. Yeah, what so Kay, I, one of the reasons we came here, Kay, um, is this, some of the tens of thousands of people who have listened to the episodes featuring you and Barbara have been moved to uh, have been moved to write to us with yeah. messages specifically for you. I know you told me. Oh, yeah. so I'd like to read one of those emails to you. If that's okay. Dear Mr. Marcus, I have been listening to your podcast for the past three seasons and debating if I should send this email, but I finally decided that I couldn't hold back my thoughts anymore. In my early teens, I began to discover I was different. And eventually, that difference was given a name, homosexual, gay, queer. I grew up in a small town outside Detroit, Michigan in the 1990s. It was a place where being gay was not okay and was very much frowned upon. In 1998, when I was near 17, I began ex-gay therapy with Exodus International. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult three years filled with depression, heartbreak, that the change was not occurring, and a couple of, of desperate suicide attempts. In my freshman year of college, some very good friends began to help me see that my attempt to change who and what I was would not work. One of these friends, Katie, one day said to me, you keep saying you are sick and not well. Did you know that psychologists don't agree? Katie then proceeded to, tell me, to show me an article about the AMA stating that homosexuality is no longer a disease. I know it may sound ridiculous, but to this scared and desperate 19 year old kid, it was the start of a long string of little crumbs that would lead me to accept who I was. In your interviews with Barbara and Kay, I am not afraid to admit I openly wept. I finally got to hear the voice of the person who made that one article, that first little crumb, happen. If at all possible, can you please say to Kay, thank you? Oh, <laughs> I don't remember which article I wrote so many. If not for that first little moment, I would not be an out gay man happily married for 11 years and enjoying every minute of Wow, life. what a great letter. There's more. <laughs> Your podcast is about our history and our heroes, 
or in this case, her O's. And I wanted to say a personal <laughs> thank you for bringing these voices to life. Sincerely, Chris Bodwell, Seattle, Washington. Gee, that's a great letter. I'd love a copy of it. Could you send me one? I will leave this copy with you. Oh, great. Well, um, you know, my care has always been for those people who were out in the sticks and who felt all alone or who were young and they couldn't tell their family and they didn't know who to talk to and they had a lot of screwy ideas about it being get bad. <laughs> so... I know a lot of people are very eager to find others. They go to a gay bar, they maybe hook up with somebody, and they get connected that way with a gay population. But they don't feel a care for those who are isolated or young and stumbling around. So I think it's important to get a letter like that, don't you? Yes. The kids are important. Okay. Well, I'm glad you appreciate my lovely centerpiece. I didn't put the flowers together. I couldn't do that. A gay man did that. <laughs> so, Kate, during dinner, where will be the most comfortable place for you to sit? Where you are now? Probably. Okay. So we'll make sure. I mean, it's always good not to have to squint in the sun. Okay. Let me make sure I get these leads out of the way. Okay. Can we all get around this table? Yeah, well, I think you're. I think because it's a, it's a, it's a special tonight, so it's not the full compliment, I believe. One more to go here. Okay. So should we? Yeah. Someone coming back at what? Any minute now. I'm amazed at how many people listen to.